Hello and welcome to You Call This Yoga. My name is Celia Hartnett and I'm the guest host for today's show. We have a very special guest today. His name is Howie Sheriff. He is the founder and director of You Call This Yoga, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that creates yoga programs for individuals, communities, and the world around them. Its special mission is to provide yoga for people who are physically challenged or might otherwise not have access to yoga. You might recognize Howie. He is normally the host of this show, but it's my pleasure today to interview him and talk with him about You Call This Yoga, how it came about, the exciting things it's done, and what we can look forward to. So, Howie, thank you for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here as the backup. We originally had Suzanne Cologne scheduled, and unfortunately, that didn't work out well. So we're going to reschedule Suzanne, and I was the closest in appearance to Suzanne. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne is, has wonderful concepts and sharing about non-asana yoga for stress and healing, and we'll have Suzanne on later. I've had the opportunity to develop the show here, and it's been a wonderful vehicle for sharing accessible yoga. Uh, it's been a culmination of learning that's still going on through a new channel called Internet TV, so I'm very excited to be here. And we're glad you're here, and we would also like to welcome all of you who are watching the show to participate, which you can do by calling in the phone number, let me get this right, 919-518-9773, or on Skype, you can join us at Computers 2K Voice, the numeral 2K Voice, and the word computers is plural. So please join us, call in with your questions, your comments. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, we look forward to finding out what questions you might have for Howie as he talks to us about this very important mission he's created and involved many other people in. Howie, tell us, how did you get involved in yoga? Well, the seed was planted when I was in dental school when one of the faculty a gal named Amy, offered to share some concepts at lunchtime to some of the students. And it was pretty fascinating. It was helpful because posturally we were challenged by leaning over. And it was interesting, but we couldn't sustain it at the school. But it was a great exposure. Then years later, when I was a dentist, one of my patients became a yoga teacher, and this is in the late 90s. So Julie had studied with Esther Myers, a renowned a uh, gentle yoga and mindfulness teacher, and Julie was seeking new students, which I was willing to participate in and learn from. Uh, I was not so versed in the yoga philosophy and was experiencing lots of physical challenges. So in the late 90s, I took classes with Julie Rozier on my transition from dental practice to going to play softball or tennis. Still, it was a very physical practice. Ultimately, I found that I had lots of limitations and began practicing more at home on my own after my recreational activities. So I used it as a wind down or loosen up sort of process. And afterwards, it, I was able to use it as a mind relaxing element too once I finally settled down. 
And I understand that you practiced dentistry for 25 years, and then some of those limiting factors you were talking about uh, created a very significant challenge for you. Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, I have a history of arthritis in my family, and I played a lot of sports. So there's been some wear and tear in my joints, via football or just a lot of running and repetitive motion. So that added to also the postural challenges of being a dentist. So between the two, some traumas, some poor posturing, many hours of practice, uh, I became uh, dealing with cervical stenosis in my neck. Cervical stenosis is when the spinal cord closes down from bone and calcium buildup around it due to chronic inflammation. With that, I had symptoms of loss of mobility, numbness, and therefore I had to have a neck surgery in 2002. Yoga was very instrumental in my prehab and rehab, and I was able to recover uh, reasonably quickly in that I was able to go back to practice. And for a while I was pretty mindful and the best I could but the surgeon also alerted me that this was a downward slope. With that, eventually I had to have a second surgery in 2007 and retire completely from practice because I was still losing capacity and needed to just get away from the career that I love but was mm -hmm. also severely compromised by. I'm sure that was traumatizing to have to leave dentistry. Um, and it sounds like the yoga played a role in the transition. You said it helped with prehab and rehab. Can you tell us how it helped? For sure. Uh, the fact that I was able to explore my body in my own space under uh, safe and gentle conditions at home with some guidance from a teacher when I went to class was instrumental in letting my mind relax and just explore what was going on and to notice what really was, though my ego and denial was very strong too. I won't kid you about that. I live in a strong state of denial for many, many <laughs> years and probably still do. So via the yoga, I was able to explore my ranges of motion and work with what is to the degree I allowed it and ultimately could find that I, there were things that I couldn't do anymore and ultimately had to act. But it wasn't until I was very dysfunctional and could barely lift my arm above the horizon. Uh, that was uh, alarming. Mm -hmm. I had to act on that pretty quickly. And the yoga was helpful in that I was able to heal and to just pause a little bit more and to think about, hmm, what else might I like to do with my world and my passion other than dentistry because it was apparent that things were going to change ultimately. I just didn't want to have more surgery so quickly. And how did that evolve into you call this yoga? Well, there's two parts to that. Uh, earlier on in my recreational 30s and such, when Jane Fonda was popular and all these ladies' videos were out there, I had this fantasy of making an exercise video for men. Of course, the joke was it was on a Schwinn Airdyne, and <laughs> it was to Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA. <laughs> so it was a different zen at the time, but it was about uh, using what was available then. Uh, that translated to this quote, entrepreneurial, enterprising idea that I could build a wellness business on gentle yoga for baby boomers. Oh. Since I was a prematurely collapsing and aging uh, individual, I felt that yoga was helpful for me and that it could be helpful for others. So I decided to make a business based on this concept that yoga, in a gentle, mindful way, that could be accessible for people arthritic or stiff or limited in movement. So I decided to make a video with my yoga teacher, Julie, who was very accommodating, though may not have fully understand where I was going, but Julie was very supportive and I appreciated that. So I'm just gonna reach over and show that 
oh, we came up with this origin of the species here that you call this yoga element. Now, you call this yoga comes from the sort of joke within our house, because my wife Barbara was more into a vinyasa and active yoga at the time, was that I was laying around looking like I was doing nothing yoga on the floor, and my element was, well, I'm breathing, I'm moving mindfully, so you can call this yoga. And that's how the element became such a nice threshold of breathing and mindful movement. I hope you haven't given up forever on the idea of the Schwinn and Bruce Springsteen, but we'll come back to that on another show. Uh, regular watchers of this show know that we often have pearls, uh, videos where our guest shows us some yoga practice rather than speaks about it. And we have several today, also from the first show, one of the uh, original Pearls of Wisdom for you this morning. So let's take a look at a pearl that Howie did when the show first started. Have you ever noticed the positioning of your feet when you're seated or standing or walking? Few of us do. However, practicing awareness of your foot position can translate up the body to greater comfort in the hips and the neck and shoulders. Consider two fists apart as the spacing, and you can try that now. Project that down from the knees and the feet, and then consider keeping that spacing, taking a breath in, and lifting your heart. Practice that once in a while, or pretty regularly, and let me know how that feels. I really like the way you slowly explained what you were doing there, Howie. It's very important, I think, not just for beginners, but for people who have practiced yoga for a while. And then you invited us to comment on what we found when we tried that practice. Let me also uh, remind folks that you can comment on today's show by calling in the phone number 919-518-9789. Or on Skype, Computers 2K Voice. Computers 2K Voice. Now, Howie, you were telling us about your idea to start this business. Tell us how that played out. Well, in the world that I came from, where I was in a dental practice in my own little bubble, I had not a clear sense of how the real world operated. <laughs> So I went and got some so-called education, more like experience in some ways that people take advantage of other people. But I did learn about some elements of business and marketing. So I call that the initiation. And with that, I also consulted some other folks about small business. However, my fantasy that this business could help others was still very in my head. So I sought to promote the video and to learn how to become a yoga teacher uh, through being an apprentice. But still the business, as I would call it, was more of a not for loss business <laughs> in the sense that I wasn't selling videos, but I was able to make some headway in the community in providing yoga for those that didn't readily have access to it, whether it be in a woman's shelter, the public library, the city park, and wherever I could get access to some communities, being mindful of my own disorders. I also taught at a senior center where residents were, and I was able to teach chair-based yoga. And when I did learn chair yoga from Lakshmi Volker in 2008, uh, that was part of the epiphany of, hmm, this is really the channel for access. Most people sit, and therefore yoga, while practiced seated, could be the way for people to start gaining access to the benefits. So for me, accessible yoga was the transition towards the chair. However, as a business, I still wasn't, quote, making money. Not that I needed to make money, but as a business, you're supposed to make money. And therefore, uh, it was imperative to figure out how to do this. 
ultimately, the concept was such that this is what a nonprofit could be doing, was educating and helping the public to learn about healing or wellness. Therefore, I sought to become, or the business to become, a nonprofit entity in 2009 and 10. And the NC Center for Nonprofits was instrumental in providing guidance as well as some pro bono service that actually extended from an attorney to facilitate ultimately IRS recognition in 2010 when there was a lot of scrutiny about nonprofits in 2010. Let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> so we worked hard to convince uh, the regulating agency that this was a social entrepreneurial mission that was an educational nonprofit commodity. And that's ultimately trying to take some lemon and keep the spirit of the uh, sweetness and the flavor and bring it to the public in another form that now people are attracted to. Sounds like a long journey there to get to where you are today. You networked with business professionals, but also lots of people to whom you brought yoga and share yoga, what was that like? What did you find when you taught in these various locations? Mm. Well, it's a cultural transition just to uh, gain access to locations, to uh, demystify what yoga could or might be. And for me, I try to keep it very simple. And for me, it has a history of a physical practice. So we try to facilitate it as something to improve mobility and awareness and fostering where the community might be most receptive to this. Uh, and that's been uh, the key is to try to keep yoga simple because for me it is kind of simple. And over time, as I ultimately became a 200 teacher, 200 hour teacher, uh, and was able to explore more of the deeper philosophy uh, that I could share some of those concepts intermittently. But the idea is to create realms that yoga could be accessible throughout the day and to weave it into a mindfulness and lifestyle, especially since if we're seated on a chair, we're ultimately collapsing into what we would call dis-ease. And it sounds like that was the challenge to help people view yoga from a different perspective. What were the surprises for you along the way? Well, there's, I'll talk about some of the good surprises. Good. Uh, because there's also a lot of bumps and starts since I'm not a trained business professional, uh, but I'm uh, more of the logistics and action as opposed to great vision. So therefore there was a lot of stops and starts. Uh, being able to volunteer created some great opportunities because I was willing to go where some people weren't formally going or had gone in a while. In that sense, the uh, Helen Wright Center for Women was a wonderful relationship because uh, these were ladies who were in transition, had a lot of stress in their life, uh, were seated a lot of the time, and looking to manage some of life's burdens. And that relationship lasted for seven years. Uh, so that was one of the first relationships in 2008 that lasted to about 2015. And in the process as a social entrepreneurial endeavor, was able to recruit teachers to take over programs that I had started. So that's the beauty is, is getting something launched and recruiting with capability other teachers also, another location is the Alliance Medical Ministry. That was a location that a volunteer heard about our organization. It's a bilingual healthcare clinic, could be multilingual now, and they were interested in advancing their wellness programs. They invited yoga in. We have an after clinic program. Uh, I created a three page uh, crib sheet for me in Spanish, <laughs> counting on a bilingual student who didn't mind helping or the staff, and eventually the person that referred me, Elise, uh, came back to take over the class the last two and a half years, and we raised money and also get support from Alliance to fund this program. So as we build partnerships and longevity with teachers and meaningful relationships, 
uh, this has been the sweetness of this. Surprises have been, let's say, when large entities decide to shut a program down that's successful, and then we're left with, huh? Because it took so long to get something going, and things change abruptly. Or also as an organization when people's lives happen and we have to rework our organization, which is a reality perpetually. So it sounds like this um, baby nonprofit organization was growing and able to cope with the challenges it faced. Tell us about what was going on with your practice and what you found as you continued to practice yoga. Mm. Well, I would say that I had some significant health challenges in 2007 and 8 between my second neck surgery, complications, and a compromised hip that had been failing too. So I was a, a hurt and, and compromised cowboy for quite a while. So I practiced a lot of chair yoga because that's all I could really do. And then for some of it, when I was in strong denial, then ultimately I had to learn how to surrender and that despite all my egos and intentions and fears, that I had to let go and that surgery was an essential part of my wellness. Uh, so it was really hard to come to grips with things and just breathing practices and, and hoping that the faith that I had in the community and spiritually was going to get me through it. And eventually my hip surgery was a magnificent success and a big fan of Dr. Vaughn. In fact, my cousin Darlene seen him today, so a big healing energy to Darlene. That's all the HIPAA I could violate right now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want the HIPAA police here. <laughs> no. I already have my HIPAA replaced. That's at the airport. Uh, and from this, my uh, teaching and concept of mobility and perspective comes into how I, let's say, break things down in pearls and the languaging, because cognition is a challenge, integrating is a challenge. Uh, when I've been paralyzed, the mind-body connection is so remote that I've come to appreciate that what I think and what I can do is can be totally disconnected. I would only imagine that those awarenesses are helpful to the students who come to You Call This Yoga events, and that your experience and the way you are willing to share that helps them gain this new perspective that yoga is a physical practice and much more. Let's take a look at another one of our pearls now, a look at a physical practice that might help our viewers at home become familiar with it. I believe that I have found something that could help everybody especially those that are seated. It is called the lumbar limbo roll. How is this? It's in the shape of a roll. It goes in the lumbar or lower back area. And we push our tailbone down and back under the roll to help Invite the front body to come up and forward. Have improved spinal shape and foster better breathing. How do we make one? Fold up a towel or small blanket in a neat way. Roll it up. and explore placing it in your lower back area. It's not a pillow, but a roll, so that you're trying to extend and roll your spine upward while you push your tailbone back underneath it, like the limbo going under the bar. Experiment with that carefully and let me know how that feels. Okay, so that is the limbo roll, and those who know you know that that has a prominent place in the world of props for you. Um, 
tell us about some of the other props that have been helpful when it comes to your using adaptable yoga and your teaching that to others. Sounds good. Uh, well, let me share first that actually in the studio, I have my lumbar limbo roll because it's in my car most of the time. So this is my number one prop uh, because it helps me to maintain the natural curve in my spine. I've come to appreciate that once I'm on a chair and I'm not in standing mountain, that there's a whole different pelvic positioning. And if my feet aren't flat on the floor, which is another prop, is getting your feet flat on the floor or using a foot extension like a, a board or raising the height of the chair with a cushion, then I'm not properly positioned. Also, in the first video, I use this uh, karate belt. You can see I have it as a mustache now. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of my hamstring stretch. So if I could lay on a bed or a flat floor, then I could also start to stretch that. Uh, so that's part of the props. But the limbo roll, to me, is number one. The awareness of how tall I might be seated as opposed to leaning back. So therefore, I like to think of my elbows as a relative prop, and I think of where are my elbows. And we'll get more into that with other pearls. So the props are really our bodies, and to be having an awareness of where we're seated or how we're standing. Sounds good. And tell us now, uh, as we continue hearing about you call this yoga, how you evolved and the organization evolved to what it is today. Mm. Well, as we can appreciate, we may have an mission and, a, and an intention, and we could start out as an army of one, but to be sustainable, it takes a team. So after the uh, organization formed with a preliminary board of directors, we received some training from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation to help develop nonprofits. So that was very uh, essential in clarifying our mission, and then from our mission to be able to develop the programming and the support for the programming. And by having that ability to focus, despite my tendency to be all over the place with the idea of seeding yoga in the community, we've been able to narrow our focus down for this calendar year to yoga for underserved youth, the physically challenged, and military veterans in the Raleigh, Wake County, and Durham County area. You uh, are talking about meeting with people and finding help where it's available from organizations. I know that you have uh, what the Irish would call the gift of gab, and you've done a lot that requires you to reach out and connect with people. What tips would you have for folks who experience fear or anxiety when they're in a position where they want to talk about their yoga but feel reticent? Mm. Well, it's interesting because I am assertive uh, because I've made this my mission. I have that luxury of, of that. Uh, and I'm uh, willing to make mistakes uh, because from mistakes comes learning and lemonade. So the first, I guess, pearl of concept of going into the world is if you could allow yourself to know that it's not necessarily what you think it's going to be, that other people have other priorities, and if we could foster some sort of benefit that's shared and that people can become your partner, but it may not be that way initially, and how can you turn that into some lemonade? And that would be the first thought. That sounds good, and I know that uh, yoga Fest has been an important part of You Call This Yoga. Can you talk some about that? Oh, absolutely. Early on in the organization's uh, life cycle, so that would be 2010, 11, uh, we were playing what I call Howie Ball, where 
I was able to go out in the community and do the mission as I was seeing it with support of the board. Uh, but we weren't making a lot of headway because it was still more what I was seeing as opposed to who we were partnering with. So another concept that I would share is how can you create a partnership with a community that feels mutually beneficial or in line with other people's philosophies? In this case, yoga has a, uh, a common thread that we're there to be connected with other people and to help others heal, including ourselves. And the idea was, hmm, I need for our organization to engage further. How can we do this and be relevant to them? So I came up with the idea of a festival where the community could be supportive and share ways of practicing yoga. Since roughly about 2012 or 13, there's still new and plenty of yoga around here, but uh, there was a little territorialism, I would say, because mm. they're small businesses and it's hard to have a high profit margin. So by being a nonprofit with no studio, we were able to recruit studios for support in the effort of reaching those that they may not readily meet. So the other pearl is how can you create a little niche that uh, you can meet that others may not readily meet? And with Yoga Fest, it was the spirit of building community and sharing yoga, but also that maybe benefit the studios. But it was in their heart and that's important to have a, a hard element. And I was able to recruit, though we didn't make money the first year, we did okay, uh, but we uh, broke a concept through. Now Yoga Fests are not totally new, but Yoga Fest NC was based on our vision that we're bringing yoga to the community. Uh, and from that, still people were asking, what the heck is he doing? Because it may not sound as clear it wasn't sounding as clear then as I might make it sound five years later uh, because I'm still trying to figure things out and recover from my injuries and life adjustments. But people were very supportive and trusting and that was really critical. So with Yoga Fest, we eventually was able to build our relationships. However, one of the challenges was we weren't growing our programs. So Yoga Fest was bigger than our organization. So that became a challenge is that a festival is a fun thing, but who are we serving? And that's a marketing and programming negotiation as an organization that we've been working on for the last four plus years and have over the last two brought the programming up to a greater level. And we'll talk about that more soon. Well, let's go to one of our pearls and take a look at a practice that could help us bring our yoga into everyday life through stress reduction. Do you ever notice the positioning of your hands and elbows on your body, whether you're resting on your legs while seated or standing? Well, let's consider that for a moment. I'd like to encourage you to have your elbows by your side as opposed to sloped outward, causing slumping in your body, or just dangling somewhere without any awareness. Why is that helpful? By keeping the elbows by your side, it may improve your stride when you're walking so that you're not shuffling, or that when you're seated, you might actually keep the elbows in and open the heart and breathe better. Try that and let me know how it feels. You can let us know how it feels right now by calling into our live show. Phone number 919-518-9773. I'll get it memorized by the end of the show. Or on Skype, Computers 2K Voice. Howie, you talked about programs and the effort to increase the programs that you had and reach further out into communities around the area. Tell us about some of the things you call this yoga is doing now. Mm-hmm. Happy to. Uh, we've been fortunate we have about 
eight teachers that are involved with the organization. And each of them comes with their own skill set that is above average in terms of special training and some experiences. That ranges from youth to seniors, some physically challenged, military veterans, trauma sensitivity, uh, rehab versus emotional care and counseling, and also looking to expand with uh, recovery services. Uh, by enrolling teachers with skills, we're able to partner with organizations such as the Veterans Administration, where actually today uh, I'm working with minority visually impaired veterans. That's a new program. Another one is at the rehab or recreational therapy center at Durham VA, and we're also at the vet center in, in Raleigh. Uh, we've been able to partner with the Boys and Girls Club through some of our youth teachers, and as well as the Teen Club through um, another organization, Big Brothers Big Sisters Partnership. Uh, we've been able to then expand into other senior centers via the Parks and Recreation, as well as resources for seniors in Wake County. So these realms are where programs are active. Uh, we look to also share, we go into private centers. Uh, so if you have a specialty group in some form, you can reach us at youcallthisyoga.org and under the contact that comes to me directly, youcallthisyoga.org. Uh, we also have public classes that are out there that are donations, such as East Cary Jazzercise, where we have chair yoga and uh, stretching and relaxation. We're also at Bloom Wellness in Holly Springs, Ladies Fitness and Wellness in North Raleigh, where we have donation classes out and about. And we welcome introduction to partnerships. There's worksite wellness that we go out and do also. Wow, as a social worker, I am very impressed by the breadth and width of organizations and agencies that you have connected with. That's pretty amazing. And you answered my question. I was going to ask, as a social worker, if I had a thought, wow, this patient or this client would really benefit from yoga, could I find a list of those organizations on your website? Good question. Uh, our organization, our organization, is reworking our website, and it doesn't necessarily list all of those. However, I'm meeting with our marketing director today, and we are reworking our website. I would say the calendar of what we do and where it says take a class will mm -hmm. then give the calendar of the classes, and if one went by the day and the title, they could get more information a little less directly. On the main page, we could have some calendar scrolling across also. So the calendars are the main vehicles for this. Also, you can come to our Facebook page where we're highlighting activities and events. The Facebook page is You Call This Yoga. And so imagining, again, I'm a social worker. What if I had an idea for a class myself? If I said, hey, why don't you teach these folks or those folks yoga, would I send that question or idea directly to you? Great question, Celia. And viewers and listeners, what's really cute about that question is it really came up just yesterday with a uh, recovery group of which I referred directly to Celia, who is a recovery specialist and social worker and yoga teacher. So the answer is yes. Celia is a growing <laughs> element of our team on many levels besides just being our internet TV host. She's been helping for many years on many levels and we do appreciate Celia. She just didn't realize how far she was going to go in the organization. <laughs> uh, and uh, So with that, yes, inquiries are welcome uh, we have target scopes, and we work to keep in our scope for the year. However, we also look to grow where it's sustainable, and we have team available. So the coordination is good if we have team interested and willing. Similarly, yesterday, 
No, two days ago, mm-hmm. I had an interest from a um, group that deals with assisted living. One of our team participates with them in South Durham, and this was in East Raleigh. Fortunately, one of our lead teachers lives out there. Uh, she's retired from her first career, and she's going to meet with them directly and potentially under her own auspice as opposed to our umbrella. So we serve as a connector for teachers. Most of the fundraising that we do goes towards teacher stipends, and that's why we're actively recruiting teachers through our ambassador committee. And you can inquire more directly and contact at youcallthisyoga.org. Uh, if you're a yoga teacher and in our region, or if you'd like to learn more about how to establish services in your community and build some relationships, we're happy to partner and coach you too. I didn't think my power grab would come out so openly on the air, and my goal to take over You Call This Yoga has been exposed now, but I'll proceed with the interview. Uh, So tell us about the yoga teachers who have become part of your organization and what kind of training or background they need. Well, and it depends on the the groups that we're focusing on. Uh, If we're dealing with underserved youth, it would be great to have some youth training and also the sensitivity (coughs) with some trauma sensitivity in that element. Uh, In the past, we've partnered with Yoga for Youth and C, which is part of the national organization, and they have their scope, as well as some of our teachers have had seminars and specialty training in theirs. Uh, One of our teachers is a yoga therapist. Maybe more is one of the yoga therapists. I'm just talking off the top of my head now. So yoga therapy is something that comes in. We don't require that, but it's a helpful match. Uh, Fluency in Spanish is very helpful also. Uh, Some teachers have taken formal chair yoga training with Lakshmi, and we appreciate that. But they've also had chair yoga training as part of their curriculum, and chair yoga is a greater element. Uh, I like to mentor, though we're not a school. Uh, Some of our teachers have come from more vinyasa-based programs and have spent some time in training. I, I share vini yoga concepts, which are mindful balanced kind of movement, have them learn from Matthew Sanford and some of his concepts in mind-body solution. Uh, And some of these uh, teachers that I've been able to intersect with in my training help influence some of our teachers. And you talked about fundraising, and I know that's an ongoing effort for you and for all nonprofits that I'm familiar with anyway. Let's take a moment to hear from one of our sponsors and uh, learn about some of the delicious options that they provide for people who love yoga, which makes me wonder if the sponsor is a food organization. Hmm. I think it's just a pearl day. Oh, it's just a pearl day. It's just a pearl day. Okay, let's look at another pearl then. That's right. Just don't chew the pearl. (laughs) Or... What about those hands? Do you ever consider the positioning of them? Sometimes we may have our hands up by accident, but I would venture to say that most of the time the palms are oriented downward. Whether you're seated and typing or doing all sorts of activities or standing with the palms down, it may invite closing forward of the front body and some hitching up of the neck and shoulders. Consider turning the palms up, tucking the shoulders in, and breathing. By doing this, you may engage your shoulder blades more fully and invite a deeper breath. Try that and let me know how you feel. So, Howie, tell us about those helpful tips and how you have learned to incorporate them in your daily life and what motivates you to do that? Ah, well, before, when I cited my fear, uh, fear of more surgery is definitely in the back of my mind since I've had many and one had a complication that made me more fearful. 
Uh, so I'm very motivated to stay as well as I can. I've also learned from my different therapies and ongoing therapies that my body is not in ideal alignment. So I'm perpetually looking to enhance my ability, open my heart, uh, improve the flow of my energy uh, because it's essential. I can appreciate the loss of it and I cherish my health. So I'm perpetually on occasion, like a meditation, coming back to my mantra of how am I sitting, how am I breathing, and then get back to my corruption and back to whatever else I'm doing. So if you're approached by someone who says, you know, I have back pain or my knee hurts, what yoga pose will help me with that? What kind of response would you generally provide them with? Hmm. Well, uh, first I would be looking at them and uh, scoping out how they would be in standing, which would be uh, essentially inviting them towards mountain. Uh, that is our number one posturing. And essentially, beginning with the end of mind, in meditation, you're in sitting mountain. And everything we do is fostering going from one mountain to the other mountain. So that would be uh, my first assessment in talking with them and just seeing, well, how do you feel? What do you notice? And, and trying to foster a mindfulness as opposed to a doing uh, and to create uh, a room for self-awareness without judgment. Uh, and if they could foster that, then that's, to me, pretty revolutionary already. So there are some ideas there about the body and about movement, about self, in addition to whatever yoga pose that person might benefit from. Yes. A yoga pose can be temporary as opposed to a perspective and a, a self-image of, gee, I picture myself as an upright, pretty aligned, smiling, happy person most of the time, then that's some place I can visit and start from as opposed to, oh, I'm noticing this and hmm, what's going on? And of course that could happen in a nanosecond too. Uh, it doesn't have to be that protracted, but you have a time to take a breath and hopefully not do anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that generally is my hope as I wander <laughs> through life. Yes. <laughs> so as well as creating your DVD, you're also an author. Will you tell us about your book? Yes, because if you first don't succeed, you go bigger. And then <laughs> if you go, don't go big, you go home, I hear. That's the new thing. Well, since my first DVD was such a blockbuster in terms of sitting in my garage, I was able to come up with the idea that chair yoga was the revolution, and there was a paucity of chair yoga books and DVD. Lakshmi had been a pioneer, but I felt there was a void in the media. And being that I had more dollars than cents, <laughs> I embarked out on another expedition of media, thinking that this will help fuel the organization and help heal the world, because I still hadn't realized who cares or who doesn't care. So entrepreneurs, it's important to figure out who cares and who has the pain. <laughs> <laughs> so being a dentist, I, uh, oh, there it is. There's our image. I came up with the name Sit, Stretch, Smile, because theoretically, that's what we're trying to do in the dental chair or anywhere else. Uh, but it's still a physical practice, but developing poses that anyone could practice while seated with or without assistance. So I created a book that was a very step-by-step -step process. And then just because I made a book, it was imperative to make a DVD. And you could see that we have, oh, wait a minute, that's Pinky and the Brain. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Celia, the Pinky, and I, the Brain, have infiltrated the show once more. Uh-oh. Uh, no, this is me. This is the only Photoshop picture uh, in the book. Uh, I really had more limbs, we trimmed them off. Uh, but it goes to show that chair yoga can be a very effective means towards building core strength, relaxation, 
and calmness. How do you manage all these arms and legs? It's not easy. Uh, that's why I spend a lot of time at home laying around like I'm doing nothing. I'm, I'm manufacturing. That was the voice of Amnon, our fearless director. Uh, I did not briefly uh, lower my voice to that level. Oh, and no. uh, we thank Amnon for uh, <laughs> helping us get through this broadcast. Uh, could have been a lot crazier earlier on, folks. So. Oh, yeah. Um, tell us, Howie, what to expect. Uh, what does the future hold for you call this yoga? Great question. Uh, we're looking to have a well-structured, sustainable organization. So we're seeking board members and committee members who are passionate about advancing the mission to help the physically challenged and underserved improve their life with yoga. Uh, so we need team for infrastructure. We're also seeking teachers in the Raleigh and Durham area who are passionate about helping those with special needs. And the special needs can have a broad definition, so I invite inquiry, inquiry for that. We're also seeking partners, organizations that might seek services and that we can develop some long-term or pilot studies with them. We've done that recently with even an organization called El Furturo in Durham that provides yoga practices as part of mindfulness and stretch man stress management. So it's not far-fetched to consider how yoga can be part of your or your organization's wellness or the people that you serve. And anybody who had an interest could contact you through Facebook or through your website. Uh, would a person have to be a yoga teacher or have a, an established yoga practice? Not necessarily because there are skill sets that can help advance our mission. We need liaisons to help build community partnerships uh, in terms of Yoga Fest NC, which is our annual one-day retreat at the McKimmon Center in Raleigh. Next year, it'll be April 7. We've already started our committees for that to help build greater relationships with sponsors and exhibitors, but also reach the people that we serve. It's a one-day event that can be a little foreign for those not used to practicing yoga especially if there's folks that are dealing with trauma, whether it be veterans or non-veterans, people that are in underserved communities where yoga is unfamiliar. So we're building to build familiarity and a team in the sense of the community, bringing friends and partners who will plan to come to Yoga Fest on April 7, but also to build relationships with folks who help with these groups so that we can create that greater understanding about the benefits of yoga and how it's accessible. Even if you're creating a mindfulness of where your feet are, your elbow, your two fists, your lumbar limbo roll, <laughs> or any of those elements, a brief part of the day, so that you can come back to a restful coda in that sense of breathing and mindfulness. So I hope today you can realize that yoga is accessible in a small physical elements, but also in joining our community in the love and sharing of yoga and the health benefits of it. That sounds wonderful, Howie, in terms of inviting people from all walks of life with an open heart. And um, I've known you a long time, actually, as a, you're, you were my dentist before um, any of this came about. I know you have a wonderful sense of humor. I also know that because of your physical limitations, you experience some pain uh, every day. So can you tell us what inspires you, what gets you out of bed, what keeps you going with that challenge of having physical pain? Well, thanks, Celia. Uh, the good news is I wouldn't, well, when I was in the land of denial, I called it a little discomfort. Uh, the good news is that the, through the surgeries and the experiences, I have tension, but I don't have pain. So I, I can comfortably say I don't say the P word unless my friend Steve whooped me in tennis the other day. Then, then I, that was emotional pain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you see, I can play tennis, I just don't play it like I used to. Uh, and that's the part of uh, just coming to grips with that I work with what I have, and, and, and that is helpful, 
and that I take the steps to recruit others to help me, and I work within my means, and that's important. Uh, and part of being uh, relevant in the world, which is not easy, uh, gets me out of bed, and so I do gardening and community service, besides you call this yoga, and I like to engage folks. Uh, so the opposite of being in a dental practice is I'm out at coffee shops or places recruiting uh, partnerships or, as we had last week at Bliss Body Yoga, uh, raffles for their fundraiser for You Call This Yoga. So I do want to briefly thank Bliss Body Yoga and Colby Cooper and the teachers who volunteered, uh, Jen Bluestone, Meg Flaherty, Mary Scadella, Barbara Vosk, uh, for generously donating their time the studio to their fourth anniversary and we raised over thirteen hundred dollars for teacher stipends and that's really what we're about is is creating jobs and opportunities for the teacher and the community to heal i think eliminating the p word is a great idea especially considering what some people consider for pain relief and how it can be counterproductive or unhelpful uh, you mentioned teacher stipends so that would be for someone who wants to become a yoga teacher? Well, that's a good clarity. Uh, the answer is these are for teachers that are actually doing the work in the field. If they've been with our organization a certain amount of time, then we have the potential to do some support in terms of uh, uh, co-funding uh, advanced training to some degree that they trade off in the future. But the main thing is about how to create ongoing relationships that are live in the community. We've tried to fund teachers in the past, and surprising, once they got done, herding cats was kind of difficult, as well as creating opportunities for them. So though that was noble, uh, it wasn't effective. But that's another one of those, okay, we won't do that again. I would imagine learning from our mistakes is important for nonprofits and people and just about everybody. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Howie. I have learned so much today about you call this yoga and I would also um, want to talk a little bit with you about next week's guest mm -hmm. Rolf Gates is an internationally known yoga teacher an author uh, someone who promotes healing throughout the world through his work I've had the advantage of attending some of his classes he is uh, someone who specializes in yoga for recovery, people in recovery. And I understand he's going to be the guest next week. And Howie, you will resume your role as our host. That's what we assume. Unless there's a groundswell of uh, communication elsewhere and viewers and listeners, we do invite you to still call in at 919-518-9773 in case you needed me to say it or Computers 2K Voice on Skype, because we'd love to hear questions in advance about Rolf and his teachings. I know when I was an uh, apprentice at uh, Moving Mantra in Raleigh, I would use quotes from his Meditations on the Mat book to uh, help create a nice perspective and theme for the class. So we welcome your participation now in the last few minutes. Last two minutes, I know. I know, I got the two. I got the two from uh, Amnon over there. He wasn't piecing out. That was two that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure with Amnon. Now, I have a question back for Celia. Yes. Um, Celia, what about your yoga teachings in the community? Uh, you were on about the uh, Y12SR earlier in the season. How are things with you and, and your reaching out? Well, uh, I am a leader for Y12SR, the Yoga of 12-Step Recovery. And I do have the privilege every Tuesday evening, uh, this evening, I will be going to Healing Transitions, which is a residential treatment center for women in recovery. Uh, I have used Rolf's book to make a further television tie in there. I've used Rolf's book because he does take material from uh, the world of recovery and yoga and combine them in a wonderful way. And I um, am really thrilled every Tuesday when I am able to teach there because I get so much from it, um, so much from combining yoga with the world of recovery. 
and uh, I do indeed find it to be a privilege. And uh, as my work with you call this yoga has been, because I am always enriched by my experience and the opportunity to open my heart further. So I uh, encourage all of you to watch next week, learn about Rolf Gates. And I once again want to thank you, Howie, for telling us all about you and your wonderful experiences creating you call this yoga. Well, thank you. It's 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 a uh, it's a passion and a mission, and the, I've been so fortunate to meet so many wonderful yogis and people in the community that are willing to participate and help and learn. Uh, each week on this show, I have a seminar, so hopefully, <laughs> uh, I've been able to share and I've learned some also. Uh, so thank you. The last little plug is that we have the book. It's on Amazon, Sit, Stretch, Smile, book and DVD. The proceeds support teachers in the community. We welcome your engagement and comments about the show. I'll see you with a different background next week, <laughs> hopefully. Thank you all for watching. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.